long time and it was departments working together, which was great. Um, but we actually launched the first mobile responsive website in Ireland for the health insurance market. And when we did this, we could see that our traffic in the first month jumped 365%. And yeah, it was incredible. And we actually, our sales through mobile and our sales um, everywhere else also went through the roof in terms of our online sales. And so that really helped us to change attitudes internally, very much like what you were saying earlier, Manila, about once it worked once, you were able to bring people on the journey with you. So it's, it's great in one sense from a digital perspective if you can use the backing and the analytics that you have to prove the gut feeling that you have, it really works. Yes, and we'll yeah. come on to sure. how you managed to um, make that cultural change internally as well, because yeah. I know it wasn't that straightforward, was it? Um, Hitesh Bhatt from uh, Lloyds Banking Group. Um, is that a similar, does that a similar sounding story to you, as in there, there's a lot of assumptions made about how the customer will respond and they don't necessarily bear, bear out much truth in the end? Yeah, I mean, um, over in Lloyd's, we've kind of gone through a bit of a journey. So, um, that, that's no pun intended there, but um, with, uh, when it comes to digital in, in particular, the, our focus has always been on the customer experience that we provide within internet banking. That's what we book all about from a banking, from a digital perspective. Over time, that's changed. Over a number of years, we've now focused more on our public websites, especially mobile. When mobile came along, that changed the game for us. And so now that experience actually starts before you come to our website, when you hit it on the public site, and then when you go through the services within there. But we do have similar types of challenges. Um, usually within the buying process, because historically we were focused on our internet banking services and what's within that black box and how we sell within that, that we didn't actually really know what happens before. And working again with Global Reviews and our own internal UX studies as well, we've learned a lot where customers drop out the process way before they've started the application form, and that's what we've been continuously trying to improve. And how have you done that? Um, through a lot of um, user groups. Um, we've now got a, actually a lab within our building, uh, within our digital building, so we are continuously, I think, and a couple of guys are here, uh, every day we are doing uh, focus groups, talking to customers regularly, overlaying that with you know, benchmarking data and other industry data as well. Okay, so Lloyd's are a big company. You've got your own lab now. Many companies have that as well. Um, Ross, how are AIG embracing the digital revolution then? Uh, Do you have a lab? <laughs> we don't have a lab, not yet. Um, so AIG, I, I guess, to give you context, AIG is a multinational commercial insurer by trade that recently moved into kind of this consumer world and developed a direct-to-consumer presence in a lot of markets. So yes, we have Digerati, but they tend to be in different countries a lot of the time. So as, as Dorian mentioned, you know, a lot of the transformation that they've gone through is being kind of collectively in-house. Whereas we, as a large organization, have had some challenges around just the pace of change and moving, moving things around and just you know day-to-day -day communication. The, the strategy at a high level that we've taken is that we've just, you know, customer-centric is, is kind of a, a cliche in a sense, but we've, we've started with a customer and we've just tried to gather as much data to make that meaningful for stakeholders across the business in order to transform and drive change. And you say you've got your digital experts. Um, as we were hearing from Manila, um, it's, a, it's sometimes a, a, a culture clash, a clash of two worlds, isn't it? Because everyone in industry knows that's how it's all going. And yet there are people who've been working within those companies in very traditional roles that have all the experience that the company needs, but they also need to get on board with a digital message as well. Um, so have you found that a problem at AIG? And if you have, how have you managed to circumvent it? Um, I don't think we've circumvented it yet, um, but I think it's a challenge across industries and across sectors due to the, you know, principally the pace of change. Um, so yes, multiple stakeholders and stakeholders across every business know that digital is important because they see their customers in a day-to-day, -day, you know, doing it. Um, I guess one of the things we've, we've actively done is try to build some thought leadership around it and engage, as, as you mentioned, stakeholders with those kind of sessions where you're actually walking through the opportunities that some of this stuff actually gives you. So I think if you can bring it to life in terms of cost savings, revenue, what it means to the customer and provide the metrics behind it, which we have a, you know, a unique opportunity to do in a sense, then you can really make things real and make things happen for them. 
and you have to focus it. Would you agree with that, Hitesh? You have Absolutely, to focus it very yeah. much on that mm. particular department and say, look, this is what you do day to day. Yeah. And this is what your department's required, what, what the customers require from you, and this is how it could improve your experience. Yeah, so um, what, we're, what we've actually done in Lloyd's now, we're looking at the end-to-end -end customer experience, but we're using the digital platforms to then work out from there into the branches. Before, it's always been sort of the, we're focusing on the branch systems and what the branches can do and try and digitize it in some way. Uh, instead, we're now using our own uh, platforms that we use within Group Digital. So we've got a consistent experience all across all devices and within store. And in fact, if you walk into a Lloyd's branch today and you want to apply for a, any type of account, you will actually go through the same process as a customer would through internet banking. So that's the consistency we're doing. And then having to walk all of our in internal colleagues through that change as well. And there are different programs in place to help them through that as well. And how do you, just talk us to, to us about, because that's what's interesting about this yeah. session, is how you do that, how you kind of get them on board. What, how do you run the sessions? What do you say to them? Well, I've not personally been involved in any of them. I actually, actually, I did go to one once, but they, they are led by digital colleagues. Uh, we have external trainers that come in. Um, and, and I think a lot of these sessions, the, especially the ones I've been involved in, is all about demystifying. This isn't about losing your job. Yeah, this is about giving the customer a better experience. By giving the customer a better experience, you can have better conversations with them. And the, the, the training has been focused more around talking to customers rather than actually saying, you know, this is what you now need to do, et cetera. You know, that also, that's part of the training process that you have internally. Here's a new system. But again, people will walk through it as they go along. If you... If you deliver something for the customer, it should be intuitive for members of staff as well. If it's, if it's good enough, yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. Uh, Doreen, um, you've done this as well. Um, how did you pull it off? Okay, so um, I think if you break it down in its simplest form, it's really about how you communicate with people. So it's about not saying to them, we have to do things digitally. It's bringing them on the journey with you. So what we did was um, we broke everything down that we had to do, that we had to achieve with the end user in goal. And we brought everybody around the table and we got everybody's opinion. And we really, really debated and kind of really broke it down. And, and it wasn't us and them. It was us together as a team. And because it took so long, it took a year really to build everything and put it all back together. By the end of the year, we had really, really strong relationships with our IT department, so much so that we've actually set up some satellite groups now. So we meet every two weeks and we go through every measurement that we can. So if we've just released a new funnel on the website, we'll sit down and we'll meet and we'll go, how is it working? So that's come about from this year, really intense year of working together. Because when I first started, it was very much, oh, IT take ages to do things or, you know, that kind of attitude. But by working together, we really changed, and it wasn't us and them, it was us together. And I think that's really, really easy for any organization to do. Yeah, same you know? for us as yeah. well. It's kind of working together. I mean, um, again, within our digital building in Lloyd's, you know, we've got the IT guys and the digital proposition people sat together. You've got the customer experience people sat together. So, you know, and that makes a big, yeah. big difference. I'm going through something right now, and I was sat, stood back there just answering a few emails, but you know, two years ago, when I had a similar problem, it took me six months to resolve. I'll be now resolving it in one week. It's a, it's a big one, isn't it, really? Because when you think about it, it's only since the early 90s, really, that people have you know, got, it, got involved in that whole world. And it's, it's interesting what Manila was saying. I mean, even when, and it's a frightening thing, isn't it, really, to put your hand up in, in the workplace and go, do you know what? I really don't get that. I really don't understand it. I know you're talking about this digital journey and where I should go, but basic things, basic things like let's just delete that negative Twitter thing or what's LinkedIn all about. People get a little bit frightened about putting their hand up. Um, how can you make it relatable then for the, for the people in companies that um, still need to work, still want to work, but just to finding that, to, to get on board with the whole digital concept? I mean, how, Ross, is that possible? How is it possible to I do that? I think you were right in terms of going to those departments and you know, it's not about people losing jobs, it's about how we can add value to what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, and how ultimately you, you'll be able to sell your own department as a better department. One of the things that we find very powerful, and I think was mentioned earlier on, was the actual session recording uh, tools. So, you know, some of our s senior leadership would be used to scenarios where they see, you know, they sit in on a focus group and they see a consumer, or they, you know, they see a piece of research, consumer-based stuff. But if you can actually show recordings in terms of how your customers interact 
with your digital presence, I, th I find it brings it to life, you know, much more substantially than you can with sort of quant-based numbers and stuff like that. Okay, yes, yeah, so I give them sort of real examples. Um, let's talk a little bit now then about um, digital disruptors and how companies can look at other companies because we're talking insurance and banking, things, you know, been, been there since the dawn of time, really old traditional companies, and you've got all these digital startups uh, banging on your door, offering these different um, user-friendly, customer-centered experiences. Uh, how, does it, does it worry you? Do, do you look to those people and go, well, can we pick the best brains from those companies? Um, how, how do you work alongside those, those new startups, and how do you pick the best from them to use in your industry? So I suppose what you have to do is you have to think about where you want to go as a company. So we know that we're in the area of preventative healthcare. So we, we're, we've started to work with a, a college in, in UCC where we sponsor their medical department so that we know whatever breakthroughs they make, ultimately the patient is going to get the benefit of those. So it's probably about working with the people who are going to fulfill your strategy you know, rather than sort of picking out people, you know, who might be doing something that's totally unrelated. So it's probably finding the ones that have the same synergy as you have. But I would say that one of the most important things you could have is an open mind. Because if you have an open mind, then you're not going to be closed off to things that could potentially happen. And so it doesn't matter what the thing is that's going to be the next big thing. It's about how you as a company and as a person can react and bring the team with you. That's what I think, anyway. And we don't know what the next big no. thing is. I mean, Absolutely. there is technology, is there not, in the States now, where it's all about fingerprinting on apps that will get you into your, your mobile banking. Yeah. Then that's a reality, isn't it? It is, yeah. I mean, we've been testing Pulse. So <laughs> um, but, um, th yes, the technology is there, but th most importantly, it has to sit with your core values about what you're all about. Um, at the end of the day, you know, no matter what, the, you know, the, you even to take fingerprints, for example, if it's something that our customers don't believe in and if they don't believe that's the right thing for them, we won't do it. Uh, but it's not, you know, the point here is what we're talking about disruption is that somebody might come up with something which you know, people will believe in. Um, but you know, when we look at a lot of the stuff that we, uh, how we are looking at disruption is that we are inviting, we've got our own innovation hub and we invite startups to come along to pitch to us with their ideas. Ones that work, we do take forward internally. We also work with crowdsourcing companies as well. So um, you know, again, you know, we have a good relationship with some external partners out there. Innovation, the disruption itself could be proprietary as well. We may come up with something ourselves and alongside something that comes from the external market. Would you agree with that? Yeah, it's all about keeping an open mind. Abs absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of new toys out there in, in the technology space. <coughs> and I think part of our role is to try and demystify some of that. You know, and, and to align that sort of our strategic vision in, in terms of where things can fit in. And as, as you rightly said, kind of do it with an open mind as well. You know, invite people in, talk to people about the new technology and work out where they can add value. And it's also, as Manila was saying, is it also about being savvy and smart about where you take the money from and what you invest in? Because the danger is, I suppose, it's such a, a the whole digital world is exploding so fast and so quickly. Um, there's a risk of, of jumping on the, you know, the newest, latest thing when it's unproven. Who'd like to take that one? Do you want I'll to take, take that one? <laughs> um, a few years ago, um, I actually, um, I'm not going to show my age here, but I was um, innovating on Bluetooth. And the owner, this is back in 2005. And that doesn't seem a long time ago, right? Um, and it, the whole idea was that as you know, Bluetooth being the new technology, customers walk past or prospects walk past a branch, a little alert would appear on their um, phone to say, the bank would like to talk to you. Um, and we thought, right, okay, this seems like a good 1984. idea. 1984. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and we thought, okay, you know, it's wonderful, let's try it. We did it, we tried it in five branches. And actually, you know what, it was working. You know, um, what we did was, you know, to, the idea was to drive, the property was to drive footfall into branch around Christmas, which we knew that no one goes into branch then. So um, we started drive footfall, we, did, we had some prize draw mechanics, etc., and it did really well. And then people saw the volume coming through. Oh, God, didn't you know that we should do more of this? So from five branches, it became 10. From 10, it became 15. We ended up with 50 in total. One day, one of the branches we installed these um, devices in was in... Um, High Street Kensington, around the corner from the Daily Mail offices. Um, and a Daily Mail journal, <laughs> I don't know if they're only here, uh, 
got one of these messages, and we did, we're very good about it. We said, you know, we'd, the bank would like to send you a message, would you like to opt in? Did all those things, but the headline um, at the weekend, in the Mail on Sunday was, bank bombards customers with unsolicited messages, right? Um, we went and did that without actually asking any customers. What we should have done was to innovate beforehand, yeah? Or not innovate, but to ask the customer, what do you think of this? Uh, and we didn't have that backup and validation that we could go back on and say customers are actually wanting to embrace with this. Obviously, people didn't embrace with Bluetooth, but that's one of the things I learned with disruption. I had to be very careful and making sure that it sits in with your organizational values. Ross, do you want to come in on that one? No, I, I completely agree. I mean, um, what we've, we've had experiences where we've jumped on something too fast without fully kind of validating it and going through you know, the customer experience, both in terms of how easy it is for them, but also in terms of their sentiment towards it. You know, um, I think a big part of disruption actually starts with that customer journey. You know, where people have innovated, it, it tends to be around um, like Uber and Halo and Co. You know, it's, it's a really poor customer experience. They've come up with a better one. I flew in this morning and I watched everyone collect their luggage off, off the flight. That seems like a really terrible customer experience still. <laughs> Like it's completely random. It's it's luck essentially if you're if you're there, you know, or not. So there's something that people could potentially innovate on. But typically, I find where where it's worked really well, it started with the customer. I wanted to ask your uh, your opinion on this actually, um, because um, this was a, um, a blog that I looked at before we started today. I know we've got Accenture here today, and um, they've had Fjord. To, I don't know whether you've read this this new report that they've done for them, and. Um, this new report is called Living Services, essentially. It's all about the future of digitization and how we're all going to be living our lives, essentially. That's why it's called Living Services. And they're saying, you know, we're in the third age, third, third main digital era. The first was desktop in the early 90s. The second is mobile. We're kind of still in it. And the third will be Living Services. And they're basically saying it's the digitization of everything. It could be like a hotel room door. So you'll get data from that. It'll be how it opens and closes. Where are you going? Where did you go when you went through it on the other side? Um, and li this is the thing. This is what, what you're saying about why hasn't anyone worked out a better way of doing picking up your bag from an airport? Um, liquid expectations. So the customer has a good experience. And basically, it's not about looking at if you're in banking or insurance, then you all look to one another to go, well, we understand each other's industries. It's to Basically, what they're saying is look to what the customer's liquid expectations are. If they have a good experience in one area and they expect to transfer those expectations um, across to other sectors as well. And this is kind of what it's all about, isn't it, really? So how do you do that? And is it what Manila's saying? It's like you set up the community websites, but you don't go, oh, no, someone said something negative. <laughs> you go... What have they said? How is it negative? And, and, and listening more to them. And how do you do that convincingly? Because it's all about being convincing that you are listening and you are reacting and moving with the customer's lives. Do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so I suppose it's all about building trust, isn't it? If you build a community like that, what you're essentially doing is, is you're building trust with your customer. Um, and as you said, you're going to have brand advocates who kind of stand up for you and, and help you with that. So I think with, with our industry, what we've done over the last year is we've built a really good website that you can buy from. But do you get really good service if you, if you get sick and you, you need to go to the hospital and you, you need to check your cover? We need to improve that and we know that we're weak in those areas. So while we've started off really, really good and what we need to do now is we need to join those dots and we need to improve that platform. And you know, it's actually a really good opportunity for us because we have so many ways of listening to the customer now, ways that you would have had to pay a fortune for in the past. So I'm a digital marketer. In the past, you'd be sitting in on focus groups where maybe you had 10 people in a room talking about something. Now you can use Twitter, you can use Facebook, you can use all boards in Ireland um, to find out what customers are saying about you. And you might actually find that there is ideas in what they're saying that could be the next big thing for you. So for example, yesterday there was some people talking on boards.ie about oh, we should really do health checks and, you know, men are really bad at going to the doctor and they're really bad at, at, at getting themselves checked out. And we have those kind of products, but we should really be pushing those products more. But it wasn't anywhere on, on our strategy. So now we can use what the customer is saying and use that to promote a product we already have. So I suppose the opportunities are endless, really. 
And it's actually it's a very good point, isn't it? You, you, you have these forums, you can listen and listen in and, and look at what people are saying, but um, it's a huge democracy in a way, isn't it? Because if you've got all the gloss and you've got, hey, buy our product, we've got this, we've got that, but you're not delivering the end product, they will talk about that on those forums as well, won't they? Yeah, and, and it's not just within the forums, it'll be the, it'll be the regulators as well. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and, and I think one of our big challenges is the regulators, actually. Um, you know, customers want X, Y, Z. We know that we could do it for them, but sometimes the regulatory framework or the environment is such that we can't. Um, and it, a, a really good example, actually, of that is Uber. You know, they've gone and challenged the regulator, haven't they? Um, and I think what, what needs to happen within financial services is a very similar thing, that um, sometimes the experience breaks. So, um, you know, for example, you know, um, mortgages is a good one. Um, so th there's the regulatory issues and there's also internal regulatory issues as well and trying to get over them. But if you take mortgages, we still require you to go into physically into a branch to sign a piece of paper. Now, some organisations have gone and done that, cracked it. I think Tesco's, I think done that yeah um but you know others have it we haven't um and we're still far away from that so um despite what the customers might be saying on forums etc sometimes one of these things we know we can do that we want to do that for you but we can't ross another thing that this is mark curtis from fjord he's fjord's chief uh, client officer was saying he's like services will change and morph around us in real time uh, the impact on our lives is going to be phenomenal um so just to end this, and we will take some questions from the floor. Um, your companies like yourselves is a massive company. Um, how do you understand what your customer wants and, and how far to take it? Because as, as we've heard about the Bluetooth and, and people contacting you as you walk past the bank, sometimes it just feels too invasive, doesn't it? And, yeah. and it can be incredibly useful, mm. but it's, all, it's just about getting people's trust, isn't it? And saying this isn't going to, we're not prying, we're just helping. It's a fine line, isn't it? Yeah, it is, um, and it's it's a difficult thing to get right. I think I think a lot of these technologies we've, as was mentioned earlier on, we've got loads of data. We have data coming out of our ears, and what, how to do that in a relevant way for customers and to approach them that's not intrusive, that doesn't break any rules, that stops us getting sued or whatever, is a challenge for organisations. As you know, um, a lot of the technology we have at the moment, although it's letting us do new things, is still pretty nascent in terms of its emergence, and our org structures reflect that in a sense. So you know. A lot of companies would have a central digital function, which has a challenge in making itself, as we described, relevant to other departments. You know, you wouldn't say that digital permeates the experience. Sorry, digital permeates the company org structure in the same way that it permeates the customer experience at the moment. So we have got some work to do, and it is a real challenge. We've got a few minutes left. Does anybody have any um, questions for our panel? Lady at the back. Hi there, um, this is uh, for Doreen. Um, so uh, we talked a lot about what the customer wants. Actually, it's really about what the customer needs and that's the real tricky part, is trying to identify what they need because what they say what they want isn't necessarily always what they need. And I think that's the real challenge. And I suppose from an insurance point of view, uh, Doreen, what I was interested in was something that you mentioned right at the beginning around um, you know, what the customer is needing when they're coming onto the website to make sure that they know that they're choosing the right product. And uh, I'm interested if you've got any insights in how you overcame that challenge in educating your customers or reassuring them that what they were seeing was what they were needing. Yeah, um, I suppose it was a combination of using what you know yourself from your internal analytics. So why are they dropping off at this point? Is it because they don't have enough information? Can we improve the information at that point to figure out why you know they did drop off? And also, without sounding like an ad for global reviews, um, they were paramount to what we did because it was real customers trying to go onto the website and telling us where they struggled. So we were able to get the recommendations from the guys. And actually, I used to go around to all the meetings with a, a hard copy of these recommendations with little post-its stuck in going, they struggled here and they struggled there and they don't understand this. And, and it was really a process of, of going through that. I suppose it was 
removing yourselves and your own opinions and your own framework and putting yourself in the actual customer's shoes based on what they said. And we were able to, to build a pretty good website with that. It's not perfect. So for example, I had somebody saying to me recently that it took them 10 minutes to find a claim form because they didn't understand that outpatient means GP or day-to-day -day visits, which means we've got a job to do to explain to people what that means. So we're not there yet, but we're getting there and certainly getting help from people who can put your, put your customers and, t and tell, you know, tell, tell them what they're actually thinking really helps. So it's, it's, it's quite old school and kind of just painstaking, but it works. Doreen, thank you. Anybody else You're like welcome. to uh, chip in before we break for coffee? Hi there, I'm uh, Jessel from Lloyd's. Um, my question's to Ross. So um, you mentioned from a direct-to-consumer perspective, you've uh, launched uh, digital propositions in various markets. Um, how, how have you found that from, um, I guess, a, a market innovation perspective? Um, so do, are, are various markets um, innovating yep. at, at different levels? And yep. if they are, um, how are you sharing those kind of cross cross learnings and, and um, co communicating that internally? We, we have a center of excellence model in AIG, so that's how we try to, yeah, you're absolutely right, some markets move faster than others. Um, some things, some channels, digital channels are more meaningful in some markets than others as well. So um, yeah, that's, that's essentially how we do it. We work through a center of excellence, which then feeds out to each of the markets for best practice. Yeah, hi, it's uh, Nick here from KPC. A uh, question for the panel, how do you manage um, expectations when you've been asked for a forecast around a perceived innovation that will actually take quite a long time to deliver and there's no benchmarking data to tell you if it's going to be uplift, neutral or negative? Wait for someone else to do it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then, then, then you're not a digital disruptor, are you? Hope it's faster second time round. I don't know the answer. Do you want to take that one? Yeah. Um, you need to find someone in the organization that buys your idea. Usually. There's a fair amount of guesswork involved as well. Um, when, we, when we started our, our website project, we were asked to come up with sales figures. So how many products are you going to sell online? And it was literally going along and finding out, what did you sell last year? Adding 10% kind of putting your finger in the air and going, hmm, we'll improve our conversion rate by another 4%. But, you know, it, it, it is pie in the sky sometimes, but you have to aim for something. Yeah, it also know? depends what kind of KPIs, I guess, your, your company is working towards. You know, so if, if you're not able to demonstrate incremental revenue, can you de demonstrate, you know, benefits in terms of customer satisfaction? If that aligns to your strategic vision, then, you know, maybe it's a runner. Anybody else? Just a couple of minutes left. Any more questions? Here you go. Hi, uh, Sinead from RBS. Um, Hitesh, you mentioned earlier that uh, people drop out of the process before they get into internet banking or before they get online altogether and you're working on sort of um, building up those conversions. Could you just give an example of, uh, of something that you've done and how you've gone around changing that? Um, it's all about data, big data. So what we're trying to do at the moment is mash our own web, web analytics data with our media data so we get a good understanding of that process before the customer gets to us. So that's really helpful. Um, the, the other part, because we've, and again, it, you talk about data here, by understanding who that customer is, because we know who it is, because we mashed the two pieces of data together, we get an understanding of, we get an understanding of the value that that individual drives to the organization as well. So then we could say, okay, there are, for example, you know, 15% of mass affluent customers, what we find today, who are our big customers, who we really want to look after, are dropping out of this process. And that, that's, that's the bit that we find is m blending together our paid media data and our web analytics data together. And stuff like tag management, et cetera, all helps. Dan Connolly from LV. I, I'm interested to know, essentially from the whole panel, how do they go about getting the right resource to deal with this disruption? So are you upscaling resource internally? Are you kind of using agencies to plug gaps? Or are you using agencies to kind of complement what you currently have? A bit of, from our perspective, it's a bit of everything, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, a few years ago, when you looked at how we were innovating in digital, it was, I think we touched on it earlier, you know, we were all getting all the Ebays and all the Amazons and all those kind of, you know, very clever people in. And unfortunately, they didn't actually fit with our culture. Um, so a lot of them went, some have stayed and blended in. 
but generally what we and that, and through that learning we've got a good mix so we've got we've got the biggest um well we, i think we're the, we've got the only digital specific graduate program now uh, amongst our competitor set um so we're bringing you know, the graduates in specifically training them on digital um we've got a, a very good bank of you know contractors which we take from our existing it partners um and there are various short-term people who come in with special expertise, etc. But the most important thing is now start building this capability internally. Can I just add to that? Um, so while I think it's very important to work with agencies and have digital people who understand all of the, the questions we're trying to answer, I think there is a danger that you could just almost silo, that's the digital person, there is a digital brand manager, you know, this is the digital innovation center. I think that overall you need to foster a culture of digital so that everybody takes responsibility, whatever department they're working in, so that they can say, how can I be more digital? How can I change this system and make it work in a more digital way? So I think it's about fostering that awareness across the whole organization rather than siloing it in, in individual people, even though you have to have that knowledge as well. Would you like to add no, in? I, I agree with all that. I mean, for, for us, it's, it's kind of been a mixture of both, where we've sort of in-house things that we're pretty sure are going to stick around, like mobile phones. We're pretty sure they're here for a while. Um, but areas of expertise, yeah, we, we brought in agencies and stuff to do it for us as well. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier on, part of our job, is, as I don't agree with Doreen, is to sort of demystify a lot of this stuff for people. So it's not one person managing, you know, the digital agencies who do all that stuff over there that people buy into who you know, the overall vision, that there's transparency in terms of what those agencies are doing and so forth. Well, guys, thank you very much indeed. Let's have a round of applause for our panel. That was really informative. <laughs>